Okay, we are recording now. Uh, welcome everybody to this virtual intern meeting of the core working group. I'm Marco Tiloka, my co-chair is Jaime Jimenez. And as a reminder, this is an official ITF meeting, which we are recording. The not well applies, be sure to be familiar with it. It's not just about IPR, but also about code of conduct. So be nice with each other. And the agenda for today is about the Coral document where activities have resumed heavily uh, in the last months, uh, also thanks to Christian and Thomas, who accepted to join Klaus as co-authors for the specification. And, and they already had some discussions resulting especially in new issues and comments on the GitHub. So the plan for today is to, in fact, start from a, a roadmap that Klaus prepared on uh, how to make the document overall proceed from the current status to a conclusion, and then we use most of the time uh, of the session uh, to discuss some selected issues from the GitHub and, and how to work on them and handle them. And finally, for uh, let's say 20 minutes or so, it was proposed to mm, discuss also the comparison between Coral and SDF, especially in terms of things description. Uh, so before we actually start, is there anyone who wants to bash the agenda for today or propose more items? <laughs> Okay, uh, since Francesca is here, do you also have any possible input, info to share with the group? Take it as a no. So we can start with the roadmap and Klaus, I can share the HackMD. I hope you see it now. Thank you. Um, so, of, of course, uh, in, in the core working group, we have two documents right now related to Coral, and, and one is, of course, the Coral uh, specification itself. But then we also have the href draft, which specifies how you can encode your eyes uh, efficiently uh, in a compact binary format. And um, before we come to the Coral roadmap, I would quickly like to report. Uh, on, on the href draft and um, there um, we have a small number of issues open in the github um, the uh, issues are actually just just one uh, major item left and, and that is based on some discussions with jim we we try to come up with a more compact serialization uh, and, and that has now been as put as a proposal in the uh, new dash 04 revision that has been published uh, a couple of days ago and um now now we are, what we want to do is uh, to double check that that is really what we want to uh, use in the end so the compact is very compact now uh, the, the format is very compact um it, it's uh, near perfect um to what can be achieved uh, and the debate is more on the side of um is is it as easy to implement as we want it to be and um so that, that that's the main issue uh there um of course what what would help uh here a lot uh, would be if we have additional implementers who would take a step and and try to get it running without looking at the reference code uh, so based purely on on the draft text if we end up with, with something interoperable and uh, also if, if it's uh, easy enough to implement or not. And, and I think the, the other um, four uh, open issues in the GitHub repository th then can be very easily fixed so that we could probably go into a working group last call um, pretty soonish. So um, it's, it's not far away. And what, what you also might want to do is, um, since this is now a third alternative uh, next to URIs and IRIs, is to, to reach out to the uh, communities around HTTP and, and URIs and, and so on, uh, to get the, the people from, from those communities involved and have them take a look at what we're doing, uh, probably before we want to go into a, a last call to, to or, or maybe at the same time. 
I also have a question. How, how much feedback do you want from the implementers community before you uh, decide uh, it's safe to, 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 to do last call? I, I don't know, two implementation, three implementation, uh, I mean. Um, so right, right now we have two uh, or, or maybe three. So I, I have an implementation, Christian has one, and uh, I think Karsten has one that he still has to find again on, on his hard disk. And mm -hmm. if, if we could get one more, I, I think that would already be a, a huge step forward. Okay, because I, I promised one implementation at last interim, and I'm, I'm planning to do that. Yeah, uh, the, the problem is that, that us three are spoiled. We, we, we have been correct. discussing yeah. so much that, that in our heads, we have a good picture of what it should be. Uh, and the question is, is what is in the draft now also uh, good enough so that people who don't have uh, all, all this uh, knowledge back in their heads, uh, they, they, they can implement it? Exactly. So, so we, we uh, need one or better two, two yeah, people who, who, yeah. who are not spoiled and... <laughs> give it a try. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other questions or, or maybe comments on the href draft? I take the silence as no. And, and then yeah, I, I would... think it, it's uh, really important to have a nice set of examples. So that, um, I did find my implementation again. It's not complete, uh, so I, I still have to complete it. And uh, I have to to run a few hundred examples through it to, to understand what it actually is doing. And I'm starting to collect the examples. I think you sent some around five days ago, but I think uh, we, we need to have more examples than that. So in, in the end, the goal for, from my side would be that we not only have the draft, but also a companion repository with test vectors and reference implementation and so on. So in, in the end, uh, implementers won't have to implement purely based on the draft from, from scratch. They can use our test vectors. And what I have sent uh, you a couple of days ago is basically the, the first Hundred or so lines uh, output of of my test vectors. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's near impossible to to implement this right <laughs> without test vectors. Um, it, it's it's non intuitive. It's extremely co complicated with all the current current cases, and let's just put a gigabyte of test vectors in, in GitHub. Does does that refer to the? say pure CRI space components or also to the or more to the conversion to your eyes all of the above well the, the okay. resolution rules in 3986 are seriously weird and and th that weirdness is going to permeate anything we we do on our side so i, I don't really know how to to fix that um we will have to live with that and the, the fundamental problem is that your eyes are not specified in an intuitive model. It's specified by algorithms in the, in the RFC. And whatever we do, we basically have to find uh, algorithms that are the same or do the same thing as those algorithms. And then you have to look at then examples to make sure that, that you got it right. But you can't verify it by reading the draft. Coral, um, uh, and unlike Ahrefs, um, Coral is not uh, close to um, working group last fall. And one reason for that is we still have a bunch of open issues on Coral, and some are pretty fundamental on, on the deep semantics of, of a Coral document. So we, we can write certain things in Coral documents, but, but we are not sure yet exactly what it means when you write that. So there, there are some, some d deeper issues, but also um, plenty of more like syntax and, and, and compression related issues. 
Um, on, on top of that, um, we have a, a bunch of areas where we started using um, Coral. And uh, also, we have uh, along the way found additional ways uh, how, how Coral could be used and, and what would be needed for that. And so one thing that, that might be good to do is uh, not uh, to rush the Coral draft now to completion and, and then start using it everywhere, but uh, do a bit of uh, co-development here. So um, move, move Coral a few steps forward, then, then adopt those changes in, in the other places. Uh, and, and then we, we get some additional insights and can then go back to Coral and make the changes needed. Uh, and so there's there's some uh, nice feedback loop that has already been started. Um, so we, we have now these design team meetings for a while and also last year um, behind the scenes there, there were some uh, good discussions happening throughout the year. And so we, we, we have now set up this feedback loop and, and uh, get more insights and, and ideas how things should be. And, and that has turned out to be really productive. Um, so what, what I have done is uh, I have created um, this uh, HackMD uh, Coral Roadmap where I just tried to um, group uh, the, the GitHub issues a bit and also put um, a, a list on, on what uh, else we have um, planned or, or um, what, what should be part of, of the Coral ecosystem in the end. And I would now just go, uh, I don't have any slides, I, I would go through the second D and um, explain a bit what, what uh, each of these areas entail. Um, so the first section here is uh, uh, syntax and semantics. So uh, it's, it's the aforementioned issues that I have mentioned that, that are mostly uh, about simple syntax issues and also the, the more fundamental uh, semantics issues. Um, we have uh, now at least two implementations. One, one is a bit outdated, but the, the, the primary implementation we have for Coral itself is Christians. And I started doing an implementation a while ago in C that, that uh, needs a bit of love. Um, but, but that is also something that could be published. And uh, maybe the link doesn't work for you because I have set the repository to private. But I, I can hopefully dust it off at some point and um, then uh, make it public again. Then the next area is, is called names and negotiation. So um, our, um, what, what, what is the serious term for running gag? Um, our our long-standing mission uh, in the core working group has been and is uh, allocating small compact identifiers to semantic elements. And uh, in the case of Coral, that is the uh, compact identifiers for link relation types, you know, also for things like resource types and, and similar. And um, the, the problem shows up basically everywhere. So in, in Comai, we have uh, a solution for that. And of course, co-op has the, the number registries for methods and, and content formats and, and so on. So it's just the, the same topic um, in a new area. And in this case, the area is Coral. Um, what, what might be a bit different here to um, previous instances is that we want to have the barrier to entry really low for people who want to build Coral-based applications. So for example, if you uh, create a new Yang module uh, and you register that in an IANA registry, that, that is probably fine because you're going through the RFC process anyway. But if you are building some uh, small REST API uh, for, for your uh, for, for prototype or internal demo or so, you, you don't want to go to IANA first and, and ask for a, a compact ID before you can even uh, Put, put some dummy value in, in, in your document uh, and try out if it actually works or not. Um, so we, we have been discussing a bit um, how we could uh, achieve these two very conflicting uh, requirements. Uh, on the one hand, we need uh, human readable uh, identifiers uh, with, with a very low barrier to entry for, for the specification authors, which might not be ITFers. Uh, and on the wire, we really want to have the compact identifiers 
so we, we can keep our um, representations very small. And there is now a, a bunch of issues related to that. So of, of course, um, if, if you, you can do a very static assignment, like an IENA registry, that would not have a great uh, barrier to entry, uh, that, that would not have a great low barrier to entry. So it, it would be probably um, not, not, not a good idea to do that. But then if you do something more dynamic where uh, the um, participants and the conversation exchange um, or, or, or negotiate some compact identifiers, then the question is how do they do that? Uh, and on both of, of these um, questions, uh, like how, how do we even uh, do the assignment and, and then how could we potentially assign uh, and negotiate the assigned values. Um, there are now two proposals where you can also find the links in, in this section in the HackMD. Um, I think I, I won't go into the details of these proposals here, but um, if, if you're interested, take a look and we can maybe then have to uh, start a discussion on the mailing list and, and use one of the upcoming uh, interims to, to take a closer look at these. Um, then the next uh, area is uh, called queries and patches. So like we have an SenML, uh, SenML fetch patch, uh, we probably also want to be able to query just a, a subset of a core document. So for example, you can imagine uh, that we have a collection resource and, and that has many, many, many items and, and we use Coral to represent this collection resource, then we might want to use a fetch request to just return a subset of uh, these um, items in the Coral document. And um, in, in well-known core and resource directories, we use um, query strings for this filtering. So we have defined a, a small, very small vocabulary um, of, of things you can query for. But if we use fetch, uh, we, we could put a query in the payload and then um, they, they, that can be much more expressive and, and would probably also use the same constructs as Coral itself for uh, compact identifiers. So you, you could use um, custom vocabulary for any kind of application and still have very compact uh, queries if, if we use the same uh, identifier uh, assignment scheme. And, and here we have uh, interesting questions like, uh, do, do we basically just uh, submit uh, some, some kind of pattern with holds and, and then everything that, has, that, that fits into this pattern um, is returned? Uh, or, or do we actually just return the values that fit these holds? Um, so there, there are some similarities to, to Sparkle here. But of course, we, we, we don't want to uh, completely clone all, all the expressiveness of Sparkle. We, we really want to have something that uh, can be implemented on our class one constraint devices um, with, with a reasonable effort. And then uh, similar to, to SenML, um, we probably also want to be able to uh, patch a resource by, by submitting a diff or a patch instead of replacing the whole thing. And, and that would probably simply be a combination of a query. So you, you, you send a select uh, a query for to select some things. And then you also put a replacement. And so um, the, the query then selects some, some uh, subset and replaces it with the replacement, which could be null um, for, for deletion or, or something like that. Um, there are um, two issues related to this, uh, but no, no concrete proposals, um, except that, no, actually there, there, there's a, a pull request that is a bit outdated where I started prototyping a bit for, for the queries, um, but that might need some, some dusting off. I hear some beeps in the background. Uh, everybody still around or am I talking too much? Still around? Okay. You hear? Yeah, feel, feel free to interrupt at any time if you have some thoughts or comments or questions. 
Um, coming to the next area, um, it's called shapes and components. So we, we discovered that when we write uh, uh, our drafts that make use of Coral, um, we want to be able to, to specify the expected shape of a Coral document. So for example, in, in the Coral PubSub broker, when you have your list of topics, you, you want to be able to, to write a specification that says uh, a topic has uh, these elements and, and these here are optional and, and those uh, can be zero and more and, and that needs to be exactly once and, and, and so on. So we, we would like to have uh, uh, some way to specify or even just document the expected shape of a, a whole Corel document or maybe even just a, a subtree of a Corel document. And then if, if we have some formal notation for that, um, that could also be used, for example, to validate Corel examples in drafts. So if, if you write down um, what, what is needed for, for a Corel document, the expected shape, you, you could then also put an example and we could have some hook into our favorite um, uh, internet draft tools that automatically check if the examples match the shape. And, and what, what is nice here is that um, this could uh, be accidentally also the, the solution for our queries. So if we have a query like, give me everything that matches this pattern, and, and we have a way to describe the pattern, then we could simply uh, use the same thing in, in our documentation and say, here, here is the expected shape uh, for, for the query document. This is the pattern that the query document needs to match in its entirety. Uh, and validation would then simply be running the, the query um, by, by inputting the query document and the the query and and then the, the you get if it matches or not we have started to identify a bunch of shapes that um, appear in many different places the, the most common one is probably the typical shape of a collection resource so a list of items uh, sub resources and a way to add update remove uh, items from, from this list. And so um, there's um, some discussions ha has happened uh, some, some time ago um, where we started uh, documenting uh, as a first reusable shape um, this collection resource pattern. And then something else that also showed up already in a couple of places is a configuration resource. Um, so in core up sub broker um, but also in the A's uh, group manager, you sim simply want to essentially uh, set a bunch of key value pairs that, that describe the configuration of a group or a topic. And so you, you have um, a resource that, that can be configured and, and we could simply use Coral to express the configuration and also facilitate the, the updating of uh, and deletion of this configuration. And then you can already see if, if you combine the two, um, you can have a collection of configurations. And, and this is essentially what, what the PubSub broker is. It's a collection of topic configurations. And so the, the hope uh, that, that we have here in this area is that if we just specify a, a bunch of these reusable shapes um, or, or components, we could slim down the actual application specifications like perhaps a broker to uh, just a few pages because all we have to do now is, is to specify, please use the collection resource pattern from, from that is reusable. Or also please use the configuration resource pattern. And here are the items that you can configure done. So it, it's probably just, just five pages or so uh, instead of um, de describing the, the whole API from scratch uh, again uh, in every of these documents. Um, so we have uh, started working on, on this a bit and one is that uh, I have uh, unfortunately only on my hard disk uh, a draft called uh, Core Coral Shapes which uh, proposes uh, um, 
Yeah, uh, uh, a notation and format for um, expressing these shapes that, that can also be used then as the query format. And uh, we also had a, a discussion a while ago, and, and again, this is a private GitHub re repository where we started documenting these uh, reusable patterns or, or shapes. Um, on top of that, um, there are two implementations. And one is, uh, I called it Coral tool. Um, that is this validation um, uh, thing that, that we couldn't have. Um, so it's a simple TypeScript program that inputs a Coral document and uh, a shape document uh, and, and then tells you if, if it matches or not. And the other thing is uh, called Core Apps tool and that inputs a markdown document and then it extracts all the coral examples and, and coral defini um, shape definitions from that document and, and um, uh, renders the whole thing nicely in, in HTML. And uh, I haven't implemented it yet, but it, it would also then uh, do these example checks against the uh, shapes in, in the same markdown file. Um, then the next area is called provenance and trust. Um, right now, if, if you receive a coral document, then it can contain all sorts of statements. Um, of course, the, the document itself comes uh, from some co-op or HTTP server, and, and you are probably using DTLS or OSCore or, or TLS to transfer it securely. But, but the question is a bit, um, is all the information in this uh, document that you receive really trustworthy? Uh, and trustworthy here means um, su suitable to be acted on. Uh, and what prompted this, for example, is um, if uh, you have a core document from server, a, B, from server A, and it contains a bunch of links to server B, uh, and then also a bunch of links describing the resources on server B then server A is not really authoritative for the resources on server B. Can, can we still use the information about the resources on server B if it comes from server A? And, and the answer to this is most likely it depends. Uh, it's, it's application specific. But um, th thinking about more uh, about these trust issues, I, I think would be very, very interesting to do. Um, in, in the end, it, it's probably very related to uh, authorization questions. Um, is, is the server authorized to, to make these statements? And, and am I, as a recipient of, of a core document, authorized to, to make use of the information that I find in, in the document? And then on, we also have related questions like um, if, if we have a core document and that contains a bunch of statements, um, can we relay those statements through a third party like a resource directory, for example, and keep this trustworthiness of, of the statements that are being made? So if, if a server uploads a, its list of resources to a resource directory, then, of course, the resource directory uh, can um, knows where it comes from and can check if it's trustworthy or not. But if then the resource directory hands out the statements to us, how, how can we, since it doesn't come from the original source, but from, from a third, third party, can, can we still um, do our same checks on, on trustworthiness of, of these statements or not? And um, there, there have been a few ideas floating around on this. Um, one is um, you, you could probably simply use COSI to fully sign an entire uh, Corel document. Then you can easily ship that around. But uh, what, what the resource directory, for example, does is it takes the Corel document it gets from the server and it tears it apart. And, and then uh, when, when the client makes a lookup, it just gives that client the, the subset of resources that are interesting to the client and, and not the full Corel document. 
and, and that of course breaks the, the signature. Um, so there, there are some some interesting discussions in, in this area, how how we could uh, achieve something like that. But even um, full full signed choral documents are very interesting in my opinion because um, in, in in the end um, you here have um, a representation of a resource uh, that, that's a choral document, and if the resource happens to be um, some uh, in information of um, who, whose name belongs to which public key, th then the representation of that is a certificate, uh, as we know it from, from the X509 world, for example. And so um, if, if you don't need the X509 uh, compatibility, you could simply take a choral document that let you describe your uh, name and, and public key association and you sign the whole thing and and you have a, a choral certificate or or you could take a choral document and, and use that to describe the permissions and, and authorizations you have on a resource uh, and then you sign the thing and, and ship it around and um, yeah that, that, that feels a bit like uh, um, um, a web token or some uh, authorization that you can use to access the resources. So I find this area very interesting, but not much uh, work has, has happened here yet. Um, there, there are um, three issues open in the GitHub repository. And I have drafted um, some, some early sketch of this uh, cozy uh, signed Corey document. It's really uh, t take a Coral document and slap cozy a sign on, on top of that, and and you are done. So it's, it's just a one pager at this moment. Um, yeah, that that is this area. Com comments or questions so far? Please interrupt. Yeah, um, Klaus, I have a question regarding the um, second bullet. What what if a third party wants to relay statements from one party to another? This sounds like uh, you are looking at uh building transitive trust right between um coral yes and... so once we start securing our core statements and, and we relay them through a third party then yes yeah right and th that sounds you know slightly dodgy to me unless... we have the case of the resource directory that, that is the original prompt mm -hmm. for, for this item if we are retrieving our core documents directly from the server, then, then we get all the um, tr trust information that we need. Um, but what, what if the resource directory in between relays that information for us? Mm. I think in that case, you can model the trust relationships so that the RD behaves like an origin for that, that information. Because maybe the, the server wants to delegate uh, something to the resource directory, which, which sounds like yeah, delegated exactly. authorization. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, I see this as the, you know, the server that uh, talks to the RD and delegates part of its uh, resource tree to, to the RD. And so the RD becomes authoritative by, by means of this um, implicit or explicit delegation done by the server. So it's not it's not like you know building a real transitive thing. Yeah, um, you're you're having two sort of end to end that compose um, that compose some that. kind of deputy function or so where, where the server can name the resource directory as its deputy. And then you interact with the deputy as if it was coming from from the original server. That, that that's sure one possibility, um, but I think it's still worth exploring the the uh, have, having one component less that needs to be trusted. What do you mean exactly, Chris? It's it, it's always a possibility to give to give authority to that to that intermediary to make the statements and 
for, um, and tell the client to trust the intermediary. Um, yeah, but yeah. if we can if we can get rid of that um, of that trust, it's just one one less thing that can go wrong in a in a security setup. So the the thing thing is also the the RD uh, if if an RD is is fully trusted with the statements, which is one deployment scenario, um, but um, if it's if there are many parties that it has the trust that if there are many parts that it is authorized to speak on on their behalf, that becomes a very very attractive attack target. I may I may have the model backwards, but in my mind, you so there's someone that publishes part of its tree to the RD, and the RD acts as an origin for that thing because there's an explicit delegation of authority. No, usually not. So that I mean, someone could set it up that way, but uh, I. The, the more common case is that a client is con is is configured to accept state a particular set of statements from the from the RD as if they came from the, from the from the endpoint. Yeah, yeah. So so that's that's exactly what I was, trying to formulate. So the endpoint was... publishes part of its resource tree to the RD. TRT yeah. presents that subtree and then, you know, the composition of all the endpoint subtrees yeah. to the rest of the world. So a consumer of the RT is effectively trusting the RT to be an origin for these guys because there has been a, a transfer of authority. Um, in, in, in many cases that, that should not be necessary. So much information that we publish on the, on the RD is more hint level. So if, if, for example, you discover that there is a, a light bulb there um, and it speaks these and those content formats and then you interact with that based on that information and it turns out there is no light bulb there, then or the, um, the, there, is no, there is no attack from that. But if there are um, some, some information in there might be more critical because they guide what the what precisely the, the client would send there. Yeah, okay. So I think we should we should reason in terms of worst case scenario, right? So basically thinking that the, the, whatever goes into the RT is potentially sensitive. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's, the th thing is, it's, if, if we had a way to certify even subsets of the information that's published there, um, in, in a way that the client can can get it uh, can attribute them to the original endpoint, then we don't have to put trust in the RD. Well, you still have to put some trust because uh, yeah, but if it hides information, then there's a there's a problem, right? So the the, the RD could still withhold information, but it cannot. Um, insert false statements and might even and then can if, 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 if you think it, it it to the extreme like it is done with dns like you might even um manage to to certify the absence of particular statements there i didn't i don't think we went that far yet with um with the issues eight and ten but it's it's certainly possible Okay. Right. So going back, to, just stepping back a bit on on the uh, still the, the, the bullet point two. Um, I, I had understood that that thing a, a bit slightly differently in the sense that uh, I was thinking that the um, the idea was to embed into the document. Um, some sort of uh, uh, security configuration hints to retrieve uh, uh, embedded resources, right? So, so resources that were not directly um, hosted at the origin that served the the resource, the, the resource, but at some um, some other endpoint in the network, and that's what I was more concerned about. But maybe um, 
I'm not seeing this through correctly. But it makes sense if we uh, take some time, some time to, to take a closer look at this whole um, area mm. uh, and figure out what, what exactly do we want uh, yeah. to, to yeah. do here. Um, so we're thinking a bit about uh, tech models and, and those things. Correct. So, so yes, I'm, I'm, I'm confused at the, at the yeah. you know, setup here. Um, so yeah. This is, is uh, random ideas that, that come to mind and that's not fully thought through yet. But I guess the overall question is, can we um, provide to application developers some tools in, in the form of extensions of Coral or so that, that enables them to meet their demands for, for trusted statements, whatever trusted means precisely? Yeah. Yeah. You need a signer, right? And you need to trust the signer. For example, yes. Okay, let's take this offline or on GitHub. Then, thank you. Sorry for creating this. This is good questions, uh, and I take this as a sign of interest in in this area. So you have been booked for for a follow up meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, then the the next area is called formats and representations, uh, and here I have grouped um, the the coral formats themselves, um, but also um, related form um, formats. So on, on one thing is that we have the CBOR based format, of course, and then that is the primary coral format that people are imp expected to implement. Um, then uh, we have been discussing a bit around a JSON format. And um, th that, I think, should, should have a higher priority than it has now. But it is probably the, the most difficult and challenging bike shed that, that the core working group would have ever seen. Um, so I, I think that, that we'll, we'll have really fun discussions um, that, that will probably never end. Um, then we also have the coral text format. And, and that is um, intended um, mostly to show examples and documentation. So in, in many cases, so for example, with co-op, uh, we have invented some kind of ad hoc um, formats to, to write our examples. And the result is that uh, every, every example of a co-op exchange uh, looks slightly different. So I, I tried to preempt that by uh, defining a, a format and text that, that has clear syntax and semantics uh, and, and can be used, but the, the implementers are not really expected to implement that. Um, so what, once there is a single implementation that, that can do the parsing and, and translating that uh, in past uh, information into the CBOR format, there, there's no need to ever implement the whole thing again. Uh, and since this is uh, aimed at humans um, to, to read and write and not at machines, it's also quite annoying to implement. So you, you have to dig a bit through the Unicode standard to, to, to really get it right uh, and, and so on. Um, but yeah, so my, my, my Coral tool already does most of this. Um, so the, the only thing needed here and in the coming steps is if we make changes to syntax and semantics. Uh, to keep also the, the text format up to date. And um, if, if it turns out that, that it's holding us back, that, then we can discuss uh, moving it to, to a separate document. But for, for now, I would keep it uh, and do, do the uh, updates and, and lockstep in, in, in the same document. And, and then it, it should be, I, I think it's useful to have. Um, then um, we have, of course, also uh, our good old RFC 6690 link format, which has known be around for, I, I think it was our first RFC, right? The, the first one we published Indeed. Um, many years ago. And it's, it's still in use in many places. Um, and we, we might want to continue the discussion that, that happened uh, some time ago on how to convert to and from 
uh, Corel for, for, for the link format. And I think we, we have a really good proposal there that we should uh, write down and, and take a look at and, and, and move that forward. Um, yeah, that, that was the roadmap. I also have in, in the second the, um, the list of known applications. I, I know four, maybe there are more by now, I don't know. And I forgot to mention that my, my core apps tool um, also uh, it comes with an example, and that is the, the collection uh, pattern. So that, that it generates some, some nice rendered output of, of the documentation of that. Uh, which I can show at some point. Right, right now it's somewhere buried on my hard disk. That's it. Thank you, Klaus. Any more questions, anyone? Okay, so before switching to the uh, comparison with SDF, uh, there's some 20 about minutes left if you want to go into some particular issues uh, from the GitHub. We, we touched some of them already, but anyone in particular you want to talk a bit more about? Or also Christian and Thomas, of course. Um, while uh, we are looking for, for the most interesting issues, I, I could maybe say a few words on how I think uh, could be possible next steps. Um, and that is, as I said, I, I think it makes sense to, to uh, do a bit of code, code development here with the applications and, and also uh, with these different areas. So um, advancing each of these areas a bit further before we put the seal on the, the coral base specification. Um, we, we have now proposals for, for at least starting points for proposals, I, I think for every area. And uh, I, I think um, as the, the immediate next step, I think it would make sense to uh, look into the names in negotiation area more closely. And uh, also um, into the shapes area. Yeah, and, and then syntax and semantics probably get, get resolved by just advancing those, those areas. And the, I, I, I think the most interesting discussion for me would, would be in the provenance and trust area, but may, maybe that is something that, that, that we can then tackle a, a bit more in the future. So what, one discussion that we <clears throat> had is uh, maybe a bit related to the provenance and trust uh, area, which is <clears throat> often when you use a UI um, and, and hand this over to somebody else, there is an intent uh, what this handover actually means. And um, it, it is uh, often important to capture that intent and uh, that intent in, in many cases actually needs to be uh, protected with uh, some some information about the provenance of that intent. And uh, a related question, of course, is whether the UI actually has <clears throat> all the, the security related information in it that is needed uh, to actually properly execute on, on that intent. So I think that that's uh, an important part of, of the provenance uh, a picture. Um, we, we in the HTTP world, we we kind of ignore the problem, and whenever we have a URI, we we just believe that everything around this URI will be secure. But of course, uh, whatever secure 
um, means here. And uh, it's also not always clear what the URI means. Um, so that, that also happens in real life. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm running a security uh, class at the university. I have done that for 15 years now. And at one point, a, a student found a bug in our course management system and wrote a little proof of concept and sent that proof of concept to one of the administrators. So there was a URI in, in that message. And uh, the, 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 it was clearly uh, uh, qualified as a URI that you, you better don't click on because it, it's going to compromise uh, the system. And uh, for some reason, the administrator forwarded uh, this message to another administrator without that information. And of course, the other administrator thought, oh, something important from my co-administrator. I'd rather click this now to find out what he's talking about. So that's that's a real world, human world example of, of why it's not, uh, not sufficient to just throw a URI to someone, uh, but you really need to, to provide the intent uh, th that you you uh, have in mind when when uh, throwing over the the URI to a, a different application, and in in the HTTP world we have link relationships to to capture some of that uh, intent, uh, but uh, we probably have to think a little bit more about uh, what uh, autonomous autonomously acting uh, constraint devices uh, uh, actually can process in, in the form of intent. And then there's the the parallel problem of setting up the, the security association between the entities, right? When the when the URL is there referenced. Yes. And do we want to stick that information inside at the application layer? Or do we want to make this an orthogonal? Uh, input? I think that the applications should have a say in what is in there, but we should have a good model that works for generic applications. So that, okay. that so might be informed, but might be informed by things like link relation types. Mm -hmm. But you know, not not every application. We can't expect every application developer to get this right on their own. Okay, so we need to have some work done in parallel. Then, right? So what what Carson, I think in, 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 I think in so, yeah. email uh, described as the information model related to this. Okay, any more questions or issues of interest for today, at least? Okay, then we can move to the SDF comparison. Um, it's something Jaime proposed uh, initially a few weeks ago when we were planning for this interim. Um, so can you introduce the topic, Jaime? Sure. Um, well, mm, well, as the title says, is uh, to see if there is any commonalities between Coral and SDF. Um, for those, I mean, I guess everybody knows SDF and the work being done in ASDF uh, working group that comes from 1DM. And um, basically, SDF is used for a for a specific purpose, and um, and Coral for another. But uh, at least to the layman or I mean, like myself. It wasn't clear uh, if there was any kind of uh, uh, commonalities, any parts that could be used uh, or brought from one uh, to the other. That's essentially the point of the discussion. That's quite interesting. I'm Michael Comster here. I uh, I sent Klaus an email about a week ago saying, "Hey, 
why couldn't we use the uh, link, the, the uh, semantic link expressivity in Coral and its ability to template to create a direct binding so that you could use uh, basically any SDF definition and, and sort of in the way that Klaus described earlier using some standard shapes, <clears throat> convert that into a Coral document and, and basically have a, a a deterministic uh, conversion, and basically that would allow you to semantically interpret a coral document using the SDF semantic names that that we um, define for affordances. Essentially, the idea would be to use uh, link relations to define some or, or assign some link relations such that you could make the SDF semantic name a target attribute, and then you could basically use those target attributes to do the fetches and, and loads. And, and with SDF, we have the way to use uh, sort of deterministic bindings like uh, properties to get put, observe um, events or, or more like the pub sub protocol using observe and actions or post with a return payload. So we could define all of those things and basically have a a really clean, uh, interesting way to build a, a, a self-describing semantic, uh, semantically consumable API. And that was that was sort of my intro to things. And Klaus said that sounds interesting. And so maybe he's had some more thoughts since then. One anyway, other those are my thing, thoughts. One other thing that uh, we probably want to think about is. Uh, how SDF describes its data shapes. So right now there, there is some some very basic uh, JSON-like structuring. Um, so you you can say that that uh, there is a number somewhere, or that that there is uh, a thing that that has. I cannot use the word object because th that is taken in JSON. Um, that has uh, uh, certain uh, components, uh, so members in, in JSON parlance, and, and uh, these are shaped in a specific way, and so on. But th this is, of course, very low level, and uh, it may be necessary to actually describe a resource that, that provides uh, coral structured information uh, using a higher level information uh, model. So SDF would have to be extended with that information model or would be able to, to reference descriptions in that information model in, in some form. So I think that that's a pretty important uh, uh, part that, that is needed to make the two work together uh, as well. I, um, you know, I agree. I think the missing piece is sort of the, the additional constraints that you need, but I also think that SDF may already have the, uh, if we just make sure that the source files in SDF contain the data constraints, and we may actually need to say, well, here's what a payload looks like, but I think the common collection shape might do that in a lot of cases. So I, I think it's worth sort of looking at how those converge on that, on that gap that you just identified. I think as well that, that it would be very interesting to look a bit deeper on, on how those might fit together. And uh, the, the first thing that comes to my mind here is that, of course, SDF allows you essentially to, to describe classes of things. Um, so on, on, on the class level, you can say that there can be temperature sensors and, and then what actions, properties and events uh, such a temperature sensor has. Uh, and coral uh, is, of course, uh, a representation format, something that we exchange in requests and responses over our wireless wire. Uh, and then um, if, if we want to, to bring coral into the um, SDF world, the question for, for me first is, of course, then what, what is the place where, where we do um, the, the SDF interactions using coral? So um, b before we can have interactions, we probably first need to have instances of, of these classes. So I, I want to say I have two temperature sensors in this room. 
and there's also another room adjacent to, to that and that also has has a temperature sensor and, and then I, I might be interested in uh, the room temperature which is uh, some aggregated value between these different temperature sensors and uh, so my, my question would be would we uh, use uh, Corey then to talk to each of these um, temperature sensors I guess no because they, they are probably some OCF or lightweight MTM devices which, which have already their protocols uh, they are of course described in STF but, but the injection I, I assume is, is then ecosystem specific and then m maybe what we are looking at is um, some kind of cloud-based API or so for, for my whole house. So no, no matter what, where I buy my sensors, I would have some kind of box in my house or in, in the cloud that I can uh, talk to and that has some uniform uh, ecosystem independent uh, API uh, based on, on Coral maybe, where, where I can ask what, what are the devices in my house, uh, what, what is the current value of this temperature sensor or even uh, where I could ask what, what is the, the average temperature in my living room? So the SDF uh, descriptors, the SDF names that we already provide, if you go on to the playground, you could find a temperature sensor that you could already use and pattern your, you know, northbound facing gateway API on that, um, uh, using that and, and basically some, to, to, to identify the living room, you'd need some additional vocabulary that we haven't built into SDF. Um, you could define an object as a room with properties being the type of room that it is, uh, an enum and call it living room. And you could use that to prototype the system or you could go look at some other ontologies like maybe uh, SA ref has some room definitions in it. And I know there's some, some other ones in some XML vocabulary that have lots of room definitions in them. But um, you know, it seems like you could add uh, link relations that say this is a temperature sensor, that's the easy one because you could just say you know, type or whatever, like A and internal or whatever. And then you could say location, which I think, would, you know, there may be some some common link relations you could use. And then you could use that vocabulary for living room. And, and having that, it would seem to be easy enough to construct an application that would go and and uh, use the function you were describing earlier to query a coral document and find the the ones that have uh, maybe you would just by brute force query all the documents in a repository and and return the ones or the fragments of the ones that describe the part you need uh, that have living room and temperature sensor. And then you would do the, the averaging math on that and maybe output it again as another virtual sensor that then you could use in another application just pretending it's a sensor. Um, I can maybe tell that um, last year uh, I was supervising uh, or co-supervising uh, two master's students right, writing their theses. And uh, one, one of them was looking into these north, northbound APIs. Um, so the, the task he had was to uh, take an SDF file and uh, generate an open API, API from that. And uh, for comparison, also uh, take an SDF file and generate a GraphQL API from that. Uh, and, and he did and wrote his thesis about that. And in the end, you, you could use the um, uh, an open API client or an integral GraphQL client um, to query what, what are the actual instances uh, that are available of the different um, SDF classes uh, and then once we have discovered the instances, you, you could uh, get and set uh, the properties for, for each instance uh, and also trigger the um, actions. Um, we, we didn't get around to do something useful for events uh, on the open API side, but for example, GraphQL has uh, subscriptions. So you could um, 
uh, subscribe to an event and, and then GraphQL would, would get the events to you. And I think it should not be too difficult if we extend this master thesis with, with a third option where we could generate um, some, some kind of coral based REST API um, for, from an SDF file. I think some of the interesting questions are how do you how do you come up with common interoperable serializations? And I think that's maybe just shapes in coral, so that may not be so difficult. And the other one is really just sort of like network management or base addresses and things like that, because I think you could probably come up with paths already in the synthesis part from from SDF. And and I think you could use JSON path type constraints in the links as well if you wanted to sort of reach into um, coral documents. But I think, I don't know if you have a coral path or <laughs> a way to do that, but you can provide, oh, well, you have a way of providing links into the document anywhere, so yes, you do. Um, I, I think it all sounds doable um, in the way that you described. And the other master's thesis was about the southbound of this. Um, so here, here you could connect uh, your, your lightweight M2M device to, to the southbound interface, uh, and that would register the device um, in, in, in this um, thing thing in the middle, and um, it, it would of course then know where how, how to contact the device, uh, and it generates some uh, instance ID for for the device and exposes it then over GraphQL and open API on, on the northbound side. And, and um, for example, in, in GraphQL, you have something similar to a schema. So what, what, what we mostly did there is take the SDF file and convert it into a GraphQL schema. And, and the same could be done with, with Coral. So you, you could take an SDF file and, and generate a bunch of Coral shapes from that. Uh, and, and use that to, to guide uh, some, some coral based REST API client. You know, that would give an application uh, the ability to go look up something in SDF and using the appropriate coral plugin to the api i uh, have essentially a semantically driven api which could be able to do as you say um, have a sort of a way of constructing a query that says i want temperature sensors in the living room and just return those and for some graphs for some control graphs are going to be selectivity issues where you're going to have to just pick one of multiple returns but that's a that's something we run into in this you know sort of semantic api is that the the matches aren't always uh, um, selective as you'd like them to be, but um, barring that, I think you could you could we could do some interesting um, work in that direction. If we had set down this this sketched converter, would there anything be missing uh, from um, for for applications where the where a constrained device uses the uh, uses the SDF definitions through some converter that is not constrained but produces the the, the adjusted uh, curl to interact directly with the devices that do not that, that that speak whichever detailed protocol, as long as both all parties uh, can process the coral forms that are produced in this in the course of this conversion. If we had a registry for application semantic terms with codes and and a, a sufficiently manageable number of code points, it seems like using what Klaus described earlier as like a registry for coral identifiers we could have a set of application semantic identifiers that map to the sdf ones and then those could be embedded directly in constrained devices and communicated over low bandwidth networks etc
I think that addresses what you were. I hope I understood your question, uh, Christian. I think that that's. I hope if if I understood your answer correctly, that it does. <laughs> sure. Also, SDF has ways of doing things we call um, um, mapping files that would allow you to externalize those um, mappings, but but carry them along with an SDF processor. And and actually, you know, you you could hack them into the SDF files. And we're looking at a way that you can define sort of uh, well structured in extensions to SDF where you could just put the mapping file right in your own version and the processors would would know how to um, properly ignore it and still validate the file, for example. So we could think about how the tool chains work and maybe come up with some guidance on how to do some of these SDF extensions. It could be interesting to see an example of, um, uh, sorry if, if I don't use the, the right uh, uh, terminology, of an SDF uh, instance in which you have, uh, like in the, so for instance, in the minutes at the moment, there is um, an, a diagram in which you have a coral based REST API that potentially could interact with uh, Lightweight N2M or OCF or other objects. And my understanding is that those would be expressed as uh, namespaces in the in an SDF instance, I, it could be very interesting to see an example of such instance because in there you could have uh, for the same SDF instance uh, links to multiple coral uh, interactions uh, from other SDOs. So you could have their interactions towards Ipso, towards uh, OCF. It could be a an interesting example if I am understanding the discussion correctly. By the way. Yes, in, indeed, that that would I would I would add to clarify that that means that we would use the standardized coral uh, pattern as the northbound API to a gateway that had a number of different uh, protocol devices that offered similar affordances, and those affordances would all be uh, normalized to SDF, and then and then basically there would be one way of interacting with all those different protocol devices through as through SDF through this coral SDF northbound API. That offers semantic, uh, semantically driven state changes. I want to see what the coffee machine looks like. Yes. How is that example uh, coming along? I haven't been following lately. Um, I remember the Karsten's coffee machine was one of the main use cases, right? Yeah, we had questions one about how to actually represent that in SDF is more the question. I think there's already a coral implementation of it. Anyway, we can start with some of the simple things like switches and and uh, you know lights and things like that that are already in the uh, in the SDF playground. Uh, temperature sensors and such. There, there's no implementation, but there's a, a draft specifying uh, Carson's coffee machine uh, using a coral API. Coral, sorry, there's a coral document, right? <laughs> yes, and mostly it's it's a collection resource where the collection items are pending orders. So you can submit your coffee order to the machine and then it gets appended to the um, collection resource. Uh, it's like a queue. Um, and, and then at some point your, your order reaches the first spot in the queue that, that makes it an active order. Uh, you, you no longer can cancel or modify it. And uh, that, then at some point, um, the, the order gets set to uh, complete it. You, you can fetch your coffee, and, and if you observe the, the order the whole time, you, you also get a notification when it's done.
So a real interesting test would be to see if you could define that in SDF and use the automatic conversion to arrive at something that was, you know, even roughly equivalent to what you manually um, created in a coral document. That, that would be interesting. I, I just have to find that uh, example again. It's somewhere on my hard disk. Yeah, if you if you can find it and send it to me, I'll work on the SDF uh, casting of it. Or I should say maybe we'll, yeah, right. We'll, we'll, we can bring it up in the mailing list and we can all work on it, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to work on that and, and sort of like at least do that first step. Uh, I found some old presentation uh, from IDA 104. I don't know. It's on the slides there. I don't know if this is the same thing that you guys are discussing. I put the link in the chat. Slide uh, four. Uh, how are we on time, Marco? Is still 10 minutes? Yeah, pretty much. So well, I don't know. If, uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, so we are good. Yeah. Uh, no, I was just wondering if there is any other comments uh, on on the topic that we would like to to have. Is there an intention to produce an example like the one you were hoping for and discussing before? I guess you're referring to uh, Michael's uh, right now, right? Uh, you were saying it would be good to have an example of this and the coffee machine is uh, in point. Uh, is there well, any question? Yeah, I don't know about the coffee machine. I mean, I mean, so internally we were discussing this already, and we have some example, and um, I guess we could share it on the mailing list if there is no, or 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 I could add it to the to the chat at the end. Um, but this is a very primitive thing. We we don't have uh, too many details right now. I mean, no, I mean it was just for discussion. It seemed like the. This type of interaction descriptions were missing from SDF. And I, I, it was very useful for me, by the way, this, this discussion. I don't know for the others. So it's interesting and useful to do in general. Uh, it's good to have a first example, <laughs> like you were discussing before, right? I think it always clarifies things when there is yeah. a, an yeah. example. You have some internal material to start from, and there again, the coffee machine. That I think you found the one, by the way. Looks familiar to me. So I think the coffee machine is definitely um, a, a good um, smoke test of the whole thing. But I think to get it to get it jump started, we could do some of the simpler ones that are just SDF objects, simple objects, because the coffee machine is going to bring into play questions of how you compose multiple multiple objects and how you layer collections and things like that um, that don't really need to be answered right away. Um, or like the basic questions of how do you convert an object to coral and what are the additional semantic uh, hints that you might need and, and things like that. And then once once those a couple of those are done, then I think that you know that you would you would be able to sort of tackle the composition questions. Not that they have to be done in order like that, but I think it would it would might might be useful. Um, to just separate the concerns at least, and then, but I don't know about a project plan. I don't know who has resources to go and, you know, like sort of work on this sort of thing. That would be an interesting question. If, if there's enough interest to sort of take it to the next step, I think that how do we make it real? You know, how do we, that would be, a, that is a good question. I think. So we just check in and we have an example, um, we can show. It's very simple. It's nothing, um, let's see, just for research purposes. Uh, can we paste it in the chat? In the, in the minutes. Minutes. Even better, yeah. 
So that's an example. Yeah, the, the chat it wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't render. So that's an example of um, SDF that has coral interactions. The coral is used for uh, for describing the interactions, and they're in the namespace. And for forgive me, the uh, SDF uh, folks and the coral experts, if I don't explain it properly, feel free to jump in. Um, on the basically, you have there the three namespace. One is for something called a digital twin. Uh, the other one is for Ipso, and the other one is for Saref. So all the reference below, uh, when you see DT colon and then hashtag blah blah blah, then that is referenced into the namespace. So you have there the uh, the links that the potential client that supposedly I, I guess it will be using HTTP in this case, but it could be for co-op doesn't matter. So it, it will be browsing this. Uh, you, you discover the, the the devices present, and then you'll be uh, retrieving the context, and then uh, eventually retrieving the the actual values. But it essentially, does this kind of uh, HTOS uh, discovery process, or however however it's called now, like uh, uh, continuous discovery, or, or I don't know the term. I'm not anyway. sure if you copied the, the right example. Um, so what what we Did can you copy the right one? See, oh, sorry. What we can see right now in the um, uh, HackMD is um, an attempt to define instances. So if, if you have an SDF file uh, that, that defines classes like a room, uh, for example, and, and uh, some, some temperature sensor, um, then this could be a format to describe uh, SDF instances. So in, in, in this case, it describes two rooms, room one and room two and one temperature sensor, sensor one. And it says that room one is an instance of an SDF object room, uh, same for room two, and uh, sensor one is an instance of an IPSO uh, object uh, temperature. And, and then there are a bunch of um, uh, SDF relations um, or, or relations to, to um, the other instances. And of course, you could also um, provide the values of, of static properties here. So if, if you, for example, have um, a unit property that never changes, you, you could just put uh, the, the unit value here that is used by this concrete instance, even if the, the class offers the choice between multiple different units. And then, I don't know, do, do you also want to copy the coral example? Yes, I mean, I was going to go to that uh, first showing the SDF part. Yeah, so I was then, just talking, uh, so to give you some time. Yeah, sorry, um, thank you. Um, so uh, here it is. So uh, as I was mentioning, well, uh, go ahead, please. So if I there, uh, go ahead, sorry. One by one or all of them? All of them. Sure. This is very good. You've you've created some SDF extensions, ad hoc SDF extensions that look like things that we've uh, discussed. Also, it's I see you're you're modeling. You're doing the thing where you're just going ahead and modeling rooms with and other kinds of things that aren't necessarily devices. Um, I've done a lot of the same things in some industrial contexts. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is interesting. I'd like I'd like to circle back and kind of get some feedback on your experience of using some of these extensions and. Like the relation one, for example, is something that Ari had um, had brought up um, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so the, this is mostly just an afternoon doodle, um, but yeah, le, le, let's discuss more on that. It looks really interesting. Um, so what what Jaime has now pasted below uh, is my examples on how a um, uh, coral based REST API could look for these instances. So let's say there's some entry point uh, API dot example dot com. Uh, and you make a GET request on that, and you, you get um, back um, a, a Coral document that tells you um, all the instances that, that are available uh, in, in this uh, API. And maybe this is not very useful in, in this way, but it's just um, an example to get started. Uh, and then you could follow uh, one of these links. Um, and in this case, the example follows the link to room two. And that gives you um, a, a coral document again. Um, and, and it's not very interesting because a room doesn't have any properties, actions, or events. Um, so you, all, all you get is the relations 
to the other instances uh, in, in the API. And, and, and for example, we could now follow the link to sensor one. And uh, then um, you, uh, of course, always get a query document again. And this time it's a bit more interesting um, because there are a bunch of properties defined uh, in addition to the relations. So in line 260, uh, you, you can see a if so sensor value, um, which is provided as a link. So if, if you actually want to have the value, you have to make a get request on that link. And then the other uh, properties uh, is an IPSO sensor of units uh, property, which is provided oh. as a literal value. So you, you, you get the, the property value immediately w without having to follow a link first. And uh, I don't know if it makes sense or not, but, but you also get a form that tells you if you want, you can change the unit. Uh, and for that, all you have to do is, is make a post request um to 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 that um uh to to that url uh, without any further parameters uh, and last but not least there is a form that allows you to reset the min and max measured values of this uh, temperature sensor This all looks really promising and it looks like a really nice compact short path uh, development, you know, with the right level of coupling and abstraction everywhere. It, it, it looks really cool. Thanks. I have to jump to another meeting though. So bye. Thanks, Klaus and Jaime. And yeah, we are exactly on time to wrap up. So thanks for this very good discussion. Is there any other business for today? No, then talk to some of you soon. Otherwise, see you at the next interim in two weeks. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.